Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of our God that we wish to continue or to contemplate for ourselves this morning is found recorded for us in Mark chapter 10. Note, we'll highlight for ourselves verses 26 through 27. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Thus far, God's word lets you and I continue in prayer. Dear Savior, we give you thanks for the opportunity to gather together to give you worship and praise and thanks and glory for what you have done for us. You, dear Lord, are our Lord and Savior from sin. Help us to understand this. Help us to understand that we cannot lean upon our own works or ways, but solely and only upon you who are our everything. In Jesus we pray. Amen. As you heard our gospel reading for this morning, did you, did you happen to hear and did you happen to wonder about the, the something that I heard that really kind of struck me? You see, as soon as I read this text, I immediately had the question, uh, a question pop into my head. And, and I think that that question is worth considering not only as it pertains to the text, but especially as it pertains to the lesson of the text. And I say that only because this text is teaching a wonderful lesson, but if you're not careful, you will think that this text is only teaching a lesson about being rich and getting into heaven. And if you think that, then you would be wrong, and you would then miss the whole point of what is being taught. So what was the question that popped into my head? It is this. Why does this young man ask, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, let me tell you why I think that question is so very important. First, every indication of this text is that this young man was Jewish. More than that, this young man was also deeply religious as a Jewish person. This young man considered himself so pious that when confronted with the basics of the law of God, he says, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Wow. This guy thought he was so good, he was such a follower of God, so pious, that when confronted with things like, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, and honor your father and mother, he was confident enough to blurt out, I've kept them. So, what was his problem? If indeed he has kept the law of God, and he has been a devout follower, obeying what God says, then why does he ask the question he does? I mean, clearly, the Jewish religion taught, they taught that if you obey the commandments of God, then you are, you are loved by God. And you, you have earned and you deserve the gift of heaven. But this young man asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You see, despite his piety, despite his good works, despite his obedience, this young man knew deep down he still had a problem. He wasn't sure of his salvation. He wasn't sure that he was good enough or that his exemplary life was good enough to get him into heaven. In other words, this pious and religious young man still did not know, did not know if heaven was his home or not. <clears throat> well, dear people, welcome to the world of the work righteous. When you are a person who relies on what you do, on how you act, on what you say, and so forth and so on, the truth of the matter is you can never, never, ever be sure 
if you have done enough. So, how many good works do you need for heaven? What, what, what good works do you need? Are there good works that count more? Good works that count less? Good works that don't count at all? And can you tell me exactly what a good work is? And how can you tell if what you are doing is a good work or not? And by the way, when it comes down to your good works scorecard, now remember, this is how you've decided you're going to get into heaven, by your good works. When it comes down to your good works scorecard, have you ever seen it? I'm sure God must be keeping one. Do you have any clue what's on that good works scorecard? In other words, if you just begin to ask some basic questions, if you are going to be saved by works, if you are going to get to heaven based on your behavior and your demeanor, then how will you ever know, ever know, that you have it made? Thus, recognize the reason for the question this young man asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, this whole history, dear people, is, is such a marvelous and a revealing lesson, and our theme will simply be how to inherit eternal life. Now, the very opening words of this history are, are absolutely a marvel in themselves. This rich young man asks a question of Jesus, and in doing so, he calls Jesus good. Now, please note the response of Jesus to that particular remark. Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, you have to understand what's going on here. With those opening statements, with that opening statement, Jesus is already calling into question the judgment and the ability of this young man to think. And why? Well, Jesus lays it out. God is the only one who's good. God is the only one who's purely and truly good. Yet this young man does not call Jesus God. He calls him good, but not God. He does not confess that Jesus is God. He doesn't even acknowledge that Jesus is a prophet of God since Already, Jesus has done numerous and well-known miracles. I mean, clearly Jesus was somebody special. What he does is he comes to Jesus with his religious and his salvation question. And you have to go, well, why? Why not study God's word? Why not turn to God's word instead of another human being? Which is what he's doing. Because here's the thing. If this young man had indeed actually studied God's word, actually studied the prophecies of God concerning the Messiah and the salvation the Messiah would bring, then his opening question would have been quite different. He would have asked, are you the one who is to come and bring eternal life? But instead... In absolute foolishness and with deep religious ignorance, this young man asked what he must do. Now, I, I like how Jesus continues to work on this man's soul. So Jesus is just throwing things to make this man really sit back and think. Jesus now asked him about the law. And if he has kept the law, Jesus even says to him, you know the commandments. By the way, did you note that Jesus only refers to the commandments found in the second table of the law? In other words, Jesus refers to those commandments that are about our neighbor and loving our neighbor as ourselves. And I think Jesus does that for a reason. It's because these commandments are kind of the easy ones for you and I to pretend to keep. After all, unless I have actually taken and killed someone. Oh, I'm not guilty of murder, am I? That, that's what we like to think. And yet, when you study God's word, God's word makes it clear and plain that to hate your brother, to be angry with your brother, is a violation of this commandment. And then you are guilty of murder. And you have to recognize the same is true of all the other commandments, too. It's easy to pretend to keep, but when we really dig into what God's Word says in totality on all the subjects that the commandments cover and bring up, you will find the truth. And you will find that you are really nothing but a low-down, rotten sinner who does not even come close, close to keeping 
these commandments. But our young man blurts out, all these I've kept since I was a boy. He's still not thinking, is he? He's still not a contemplator of the truth and revelation of God. He still does not grasp that the reason he has to go to the temple and make those sacrifices and offerings on a regular basis is because of his sin. This young man still thinks that the purpose of the commandments is to show how to earn salvation rather than, as God gave them, to show his condemnation. So clearly, this, this young man is off the mark. That's when Jesus puts the hammer down. Jesus says, one thing you lack. Go, sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come, follow me. In essence, Jesus says to him, so you're religious? You say you are someone who keeps the commands of God? Well, how about that first commandment? How about you and I make sure that God is number one in everything? How about showing that God is the most important to you by going out, selling your possessions, giving to the poor, and then following me? Now understand, Jesus told him he lacked one thing. That one thing was true faith and trust in God. That one thing was the lack of absolute trust in what God has decreed in his law and in what God has revealed in the promises of the Savior. And Jesus makes it clear to him, you lack putting God first. And Jesus drives home that point by challenging the very wealth that God had blessed that young man with. By the way, if Jesus were to say to you, to you, go, sell everything, give the money to the poor, and in this way, you will find treasure in heaven, would you do it? Well, let's get maybe a little more personal. How about if Jesus said this, go! Sell your uniforms and your bats and your balls and your gloves and everything else pertaining to that and follow me. How about this one? Go! Sell your guns. Sell your hunting outfits. Sell your bows and your duck calls and all related material. And now you devote your time to me. Same amount of time you're spending in that. What, need one more? Go! Sell your boat, your cabin, your second car, and all things related to your second things, and give the money to the church, and now spend your time with me. Now, I'm just going to kind of smile and say, you, you know, we could do this all day, right? And you go, oh, yeah. But, but I think you've got the picture. What would you do if Jesus had spoken to you. Now, just so we're clear, I believe you can have all of those things, you can have all of those things and still be a true and wonderful believer in the Lord, but don't, don't make those things more important and more necessary than Jesus. Don't make anything bigger than Jesus and the wonderful gift of faith that Jesus has sent us through the work of his Holy Spirit. Now back to our text. Now in our text, this is where people get themselves into trouble. They hear how this young man walked away sad because he had great wealth. Now, first of all, I just want you to think, he walked away from Jesus. Just, just let that sink in. He walked away from Jesus. And our text says, Jesus loved him. Jesus turns to the disciples and says how hard it is for the rich to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, what Jesus says is true. And that's because those with wealth have a tendency to focus on the wealth, to consider the wealth the end-all and the be-all of their life. So when we make our life 
about our material goods when we make our focus all about the comfort and the personal happiness that we have. It, it's so easy, dear people. It's so easy to lose the wonder and the marvel of God. Why? Because we can con ourselves, con ourselves into thinking that we have all of this stuff because God must surely love me. Or the modern day equivalent of that particular statement is look, look how God has blessed me. Well, be careful. Be careful with wealth and material things. And I want you to know that's not even the heart of the lesson. Verse 21 says this, the disciples were amazed at his words. And why? Well, because what I just said about those with wealth was obviously the way that the disciples thought. In other words, they thought, well, if you have wealth and goods, then God must surely love you. But if Jesus says you're not going to make it as a rich person, and that's what he says, then please note that they are now completely stumped. And so Jesus continues to teach. And he says, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. See the shift there? You see, all of a sudden the lesson is that it's hard to enter the kingdom of God. Now, it's harder for the rich, but nevertheless, the lesson has been expanded. It is hard, hard to enter the kingdom of God. And, and I love how Jesus calls them children. I think he's pointing to their lack of understanding. They were children in the sense that they could not grasp that what this young man lacked is the same problem that lots of people in this world lack. And it, the truth is, it may have been true that the disciples at this very moment lacked the same thing, true faith in God. So I have no doubt that the word children here is a mild redress of Jesus for their lack of understanding. And you have to get that the disciples get it. Pay attention to the text. You see, they then say, they're all the more amazed, <coughs> who then can be saved? See, if the blessed of God aren't getting in, well, who's going to make it? That's, that's the way we have a tendency to think in this world, isn't it? Now, grass, that would be the, the typical viewpoint of the work righteous. I mean, the work righteous tend to think, well, surely the, the pious, the religious man is going to, you know, is going to be wealthy because God is, is going to, you know, show his love to him and God is just going to want to bless him, right? <laughs> but that idea is now crushed. Crushed. And the disciples are brought to the right question. The right question. Who then? can be saved. And the answer? With man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. There it is. There it is. The wonderful heart of this lesson. If your desire is to be saved, if your desire is to enter into the kingdom of God and to have the promises of eternal life and salvation, then stop. Stop looking to yourself. Stop looking to your works or anything that points to and emphasizes that you are the reason for your being saved. Because as Jesus makes abundantly clear here, it is impossible for man to save himself. So yeah, if, if you think going to church, you know, if you think reading your Bible or living piously, now all those things a Christian will do, not because he has to, but because he wants to, but if you think those things, and you know that list is really pretty long, if you think those things are the reason and the difference between your going to heaven or ending up in hell, then I want to let you know that you have the very same problem that this rich young man and the disciples had. Because you think salvation is all about you rather than about Jesus. God makes salvation possible because God prompts, God sent, and God fulfilled in Jesus the requirement of redemption. And just so you know, the requirement for entering eternal salvation is total perfection. 
You must be pure and holy in everything. Thought, word, and deed. No flaws ever. And, and notice, not close, not almost, but you must be pure and holy just as God the Father is pure, holy, and perfect in everything. That's the standard for getting into heaven. And that's why it's impossible for us to do it. So God, in love, sent his son Jesus to do it for us. Because you see, Jesus was pure and holy. Jesus kept the law. He kept all of the law of God in every way. And then Jesus went to the cross, the cross, to suffer the totality of eternal damnation for every single soul that has ever lived. And to make sure that we grasp this awesome gift of Jesus, God set. He set the resurrection as the stamp of his approval. It's this simple. Because Jesus lives, we are forgiven and we also will live. Because Jesus lives, we are counted before God as holy and perfect, pure and clean in all things to the glory of God's name. Yes, in Jesus and only in Jesus, we have been given the gift of eternal life with God in heaven because of the forgiveness that Jesus Christ gives us through his sacrifice on the cross. But please, there needs to be faith. Faith is the gift of God given as the Son and the Father send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, we are told, works through the gospel in word and sacrament. The Holy Spirit gives the gift of faith, and then as we keep the gospel in word and sacrament before us, the Holy Spirit continues to work in us and to keep us and to strengthen us and to reassure us of our status as God's children of the fact that we have eternal life and salvation. Please make no mistake. The Holy Spirit guides you to Jesus. The Holy Spirit guides you to think of, to marvel in, to worship and praise and honor Jesus. The Holy Spirit does not come so, so that you can obey Jesus. The Holy Spirit does not come so that you can live the pious life and then earn your salvation. That's the same problem the young man had. He comes to direct you to Jesus and what Jesus has done for you because it is impossible for man to earn salvation by himself on his own. But with God, it is possible to be saved because of what Jesus has done and accomplished for you. So, we don't have to ask the question the young man did. Because in Jesus, we can be sure. In Jesus, you can know about the sureness of forgiveness. In Jesus, you don't have to walk away sad. But rather, you can stay there with Jesus. And you can see the love of Jesus. And you can make sure you know the right question and the right answer. That God has. And God will give that gift of salvation to you through Jesus. It's what Jesus is all about. Amen.